You've probably been hearing a lot about clustered columns or indexes over the years, but did you know that we've been improving them since SQL Server 2012 and they're also available in Azure SQL? Learn all about them and see some exciting demos this week on Data Exposed MVP Edition. Hi, I'm Anna Hoffman, and welcome to this episode of Data Exposed MVP Edition. Today, I'm joined by Ed. Ed, thanks so much for joining us today. We're super excited to have you on the show. Can you kick us off by telling us a little bit about what you do? Sure. I'm, I'm Edward Pollack. I've been a data architect for a while. I work with data. Um, I'm the leader of the uh, Capital Area SQL Server Group out in Albany, New York. I've helped run many different events, including um, SQL Saturday Albany, New York City, New Jersey. Um, I, I love speaking at events very involved in the community that's to me is fun uh, in a strange way, um, but I do love it. I love learning, I love sharing. Um, that's kind of what I do. I've written books and articles and lots of other things. Um, so that's me, uh, I have a family here. Um, they're currently several floors above me so they don't make noise. You're not here stomping and screaming. Um, that's great, um, that's who I am and uh, yeah. Awesome. Well, we're super excited to have you on the show. I love all that you do for the community. Um, I'm sure our viewers are really appreciative of that and are aware of that. Um, for our viewers, we will put um, some links for you to check into some of the stuff Ed does if you want to learn more. Um, but today we're going to be talking about column store indexes, specifically clustered column store indexes. And I know this is something that's been around for a while, but there's Still folks who don't know what it is or what it's used for. And in SQL Server 2022, it got even better. So let's go back to the basics. And um, Ed, can you tell me, like, why should people care about clustered columns or indexes and what are they? It's, it's a great way to store analytic data in SQL Server. And the key with it is that it started in 2012. So this, this thing's been out for like 11 years. <clears throat> Since it was released, it's gotten better with every version. The initial release was very limited. You couldn't do a lot with it, and it was very read-only in nature. And so it made it very hard to use, so a lot of people just shrugged it off and, and didn't use it. And then it evolved and got better and better and better and better to the point where the basic tech underneath this is the same tech used in pretty much all the other analytic data storage you interface with. So SQL Server Analysis Services, Power BI, um, you know, Parquet Files, uh, Power Pivot, all basically have the same type of compression algorithms and columnar storage underneath them. So, and you have lots of places you can store your data. If you're in SQL Server anyway, this is a very, very convenient place to put your data. It's great for data warehouse style data or data that repeats a lot. And when I say it's big, I mean like millions, billions of rows more. So big, big data being hit by analytic queries that scan lots and lots of rows. And why SQL Server? You already have it. You're already paying for it. You use it. And if that's the case and it's convenient, it's a great place to put it. Okay, cool. Okay, so you, I'm, I'm sold. Like you <laughs> should use clustered column store indexes, especially if we're yes, doing so any type of analytics. But how does it work? It's a great question. So the basic idea behind column store is that you take all your many rows of data, which you know in a row store index, you have all your columns, you do row one, all your columns, row two, all your columns, and it's great for grabbing rows. In column store world analytic queries, you grab lots and lots of rows, but you watch the column or two. So you take the data, you break it down into row groups, it's two to the 20th rows, about a million, and then each column within each is then compressed separately until it's called a segment. <clears throat> By compressing each column separately and in separate row groups, you can compress each differently. So the compression is very, very good. In fact, I'd love to just do a quick demo of how good the compression is. Yeah. So I'm going to just kind of jump in here. I, all these tables are set up already because nobody wants to sit and wait. I don't want to sit and wait. You don't want to sit and wait. Nobody does. So I've set up a bunch of demo tables. They're just column store index tables. I'm sorry, the tables that are big, that have a lot of data in them. Some are column store, some are row store. And they have about 23 million rows in them, uh, which in the grand scheme of things, not too big, but big enough to demo. So we got a big table here, which is just a big pile of data with a cluster PK, no compression. We have a table that is a com page compressed table, same data, page compressed. We have a table with a column store index, same data, just column store index. We have one that's in order by date. We'll talk about that a bit later. And the last one is archive compressed, which is just a stronger form of column store compression, it takes more resources to do but also compresses more. One benefit of compression like this is that you're not just compressing your pages on storage, and saving storage, but they get read into memory compressed. So your memory is saved as well. 
that's a huge deal. So we're just going to run a query here <clears throat> that shows how much space is used by each of these tables. We can see that our uncompressed data is about 5 gigs. But as we begin going through, we page compress it, we cut it a little bit more than in half. We column store it, it goes down to 300 and something megs. You order it, and you may wonder, why would ordering data make it more efficient? And the answer is that data that's close in proximity by time tends to be more similar. If you were to have a big pile of data for over the course of 10 years, and you were to sample the data from today and compare it to the data tomorrow, it would be much more similar than comparing today's data to 10 years ago. And as you can imagine, when compressing data, data that repeats more often is more similar, compresses better. <clears throat> And then last but not least, if you want to, if you're interested in archive compression, that's a, a, a stronger form of compression. It does more under the covers, but it costs more. So you can go from 5 gigs down to 100 megs. And it's the same data. It's lossless. And it'll be way faster that way. You don't have to scan 5 gigs of data now. You can scan 100 megs or a chunk of 100 megs, which is quite advantageous. Wow. Yeah, no, that's, that's pretty amazing. Um, now, I mean, like, if you're getting started with this, like, are there some key things that you need to know when you go to, you know, try to use this or implement it? Sure. Um, a big key about this is the data in columns or indexes is not ordered at all. You create the order for yourself. 2022, SQL Server 2022 introduced a feature called ordered cluster columns or indexes, where you can apply an order clause to your index, you can rebuild it, and it'll try to reorder the data for you. It's a bit of an expensive process. I don't have time to go into the details of how it works. It's worth investigating. Um, but needless to say, the easiest way to manage order is to do it yourself. The good news is that most data warehouse style data, you insert your data in order. So you have this big pile of historical data going back how far it goes. And then today's data load occurs. You pour all of today's data into that pile, and you do that every day. And so naturally, your data orders. It's an important thing to learn about is that the data is not ordered naturally, like in a normal index, a row store index, where the index is you put key columns in and they order by it. Here, there's no key columns. Your whole index, your clustered columns, your index, that is your index. There's no order. And to kind of even like put a little more perspective on how it looks, I'm just going to run a simple query here. I'm going to put on execution plan. And you know, this, this query is hitting like, what, 3 million rows. And if you look at your execution plan, you're reminded of the fact that there's no order because your operator is a scan. And that means not that you're scanning the whole table, but they are scanning segments. You're scanning chunks of data. It's kind of a reminder that this is not a row store index. You're not seeking out rows. You're grabbing piles of data, heavily compressed, bringing them back, and then analyzing them. So that's just kind of a reminder that there's no order here. You create the order. The table that I appended order to is a table that I personally went through and ensured the data was in order. And that kind of falls to you as well. If your data is not ordered, it won't compress as well, and SQL Server can't search as well through it using its metadata and other internal features to it. Gotcha. Okay, that makes sense. It's a good learning. Now, another question that I have is, uh, why would someone use a clustered column store index versus a regular? It's a good question. So when you choose your clustered index, you're choosing the index, it's really your storage structure. Uh, a column store index isn't really another index. It's a whole new way of storing your data by column instead of row. And <clears throat> your cluster index should really typify your use case. If you have transactional row-based data, like for sales orders or things like that, you want a regular clustered index, a row store index. If your purpose of your data primarily is analytics, you want a column store index. You can mix and match. You can have non-clustered column store or row store on top of the other, but you have a lot of trade-offs. A non-clustered row store on top of a clustered column store uses a lot of space because you have this big compressed thing then all these rows and you're trying to map it. It's very complicated. So you really want to choose the one for your use case and accept that it's going to perform well. If you're working with data warehouse or analytic data, this is the way to go. And ideally, you would have just this index and no non-clusters on it. You should always try that out first. And only add non-clusters if you need them, absolutely need them. Very often you won't, though. Okay, that's that's great to know. Um, what else should people know uh, about clustered columns or indexes, maybe specific to 2022? I don't know. Sure, um, I'll do some of the overall. Uh, the big imp improvements to 2022 Ordered clustered column store, which is something you can look up and learn about online. It's kind of a big topic. And also, um, they have better predicate pushdown. So you can actually get segment elimination 
by strings and other data types that weren't allowed. So when I say segment elimination, there's metadata available in columns or indexes. And unlike stats, which are kind of like these things under the covers, the optimizer uses metadata here is used by the optimizer directly. And you can look at it, which is kind of cool. I'll demo that in a few moments. Um, so there's things like metadata that are very useful. Uh, batch execution is available for column store indexes, something that allows many rows to be processed operator by operator by the optimizer and the execution engine as opposed to one at a time, which you're dealing with lots of rows, that's a great deal, it's faster. There are other structures that help out the column store index, it's a very heavily compressed structure. How do you write to something that's heavily compressed? You can't just do it. And so there are structures in the side that help. The biggest thing that happens with inserting data into the columnster index is that if you insert more than about 102,400 rows, actually exactly that amount, into a columnster index at one time, it'll revert to a minimally logged bulk insert. And that is a huge benefit for inserting millions, tons of rows into a table, because it means that you now minimally log it, it's fast, you have to log the details of every row, just enough to roll back the transactions. If you're inserting data into column store, you can insert lots of rows at once, which is the opposite of in the transaction where you try to batch things and avoid blocking. Here, more is better. <clears throat> if you insert less than that amount, there's a structure called the delta store, which is a heap that will store the data temporarily. It's part of the table. You'll read it. You don't have to do anything special. But in the background, it's kind of a heap that holds the data, uh, and they'll trickle it into the column store index over time. Subsequently, del uh, deletes are soft deletes. Again, Deleting rows out of a big compressed, stru compressed structure is complicated and expensive. So you delete rows. There's a flag in there with each row, um, row group that says which rows are deleted. So when you delete rows, it just sets the flag to one, and they get ignored. And then in the newer versions of SQL Server 2019 and on, reorgs, uh, index reorganization processes, will get rid of those and clean them up and combine your row groups and do nice things for you. Lastly, updates are the combination of them. You should avoid updates at all costs. So my general guidance is don't update a clustered columns or index ever. If you need to do updates, do a delete followed by an insert because when you do an update in one big transaction, it can't use bulk insert. It can't use all the nice things that it can do behind the scenes to make it fast. And so you really want to just do deletes, inserts, no updates. Even if it seems silly, it's a good best practice to have. I'd love to actually demo some of the metadata. Uh, a beautiful thing about this is that you can actually see all the metadata about how your columns or index works. Uh, I'll just demo row groups and segments because they're kind of the, the primary structures involved here. So this qu query here, all the row groups within this columns or index that I have here. You can see I have the table, the index, the partition, and there's 23 of these row groups. Most have the maximum number of rows possible except for the last one that got the remainder. It's the size in kilobytes. There's more in here. These are going to be the most important things to see, though, is how big is it? How many rows are? Is it open or not? Cool. Do the same for segments as well. So each individual segment and all the compressed data inside of it, you'll have one segment per column per row group. That's how many segments you'll have in total. It's 437 total in this columns or index. And I can join it back to the column information. So I can see information about how many rows. Uh, other nulls in it, I can see how it's value encoded, a type of compression. How is it done? Any details? Is there dictionary compression? If so, what are the details of that? It even provides some information on the size and min and max IDs. So how is the data ordered? Uh, what values are within the range? And if it's not numeric, it'll be some identifier for a lookup. So you can get a lot of detail here on what your data looks like without having to like do any kind of DBCC commands or anything crazy like that. Gotcha. That's super cool. Super useful. So um, I mentioned earlier data order is important. You're in charge of your data order in column store as opposed to with row store it does it all for you. And you can view your data order by looking at your segment metadata. And I can look at one column. You'll say order date key is my key column. All my big queries are over month, over week, over quarter. And so everything should be ordered by date. And if it orders by date, I'm happy. I can check the order by looking at it, and I can take my one column, put all the segments in order, and then look at it and say, all right, these min data and max data IDs are just numeric indicators of dates. Um, you can't really read them as a date, but the numbers matter, and you can see they go in order. And so as I move through these segments, I can see the numbers are going up. That tells me my data is ordered, and that's key. That means it'll compress better, and it'll perform better. A uh, huge, huge bunch of benefit right there. Um, the, the compression is 
you know, you can get three, five X more compression by just having ordered data and column store compared to row store, 10 X, a hundred X, just huge, huge improvements on compression. Wow. Awesome. Ed, this has been super great. I've learned so much. I think our viewers have probably learned a lot as well. Um, for our viewers, we're going to put some links in the description for you to learn more. Um, we'll also put contact info for Ed if you want to follow him on Twitter or see some of the other things he does in the community. Um, if you like this episode, go ahead, give it a like, leave us a comment and let us know what you think. And we hope to see you next time on Data Exposed. Mm -hmm.